Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the AI Marketing Stacks podcast. And today I'm here with Jordan Metterick, who is the founder of Drop Funnels, which is a, um, a funnel building uh, platform. And we're going to be talking about all things AI, all things marketing, um, some of uh, Jordan's contrarian views on AI and um, some of the cool things that they're working on uh, behind the scenes over at um, Drop Funnels. So thanks for being here, man. Yeah, glad to be here. Thanks for the invite. Awesome. So first question is, what are you working on personally right now that has you the most excited? Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I'm working on something that's, it's, it's tough to both describe because it doesn't really exist, but it's also tough to reveal too much information because it's, I think such a, such a good idea. Some people might take it. Sure. Uh, and maybe, uh, people who are more talented than me can get to market first. Um, but I've been working on a project that, uh, is effectively, it has the goal of allowing AI to make decisions for your business. So generally my, my contrarian view on AI is that yes, it's great, but in five years from now, we're all, all going to be generally puking at how elementary it is at this point in time right now, like how basic and rudimentary it is. Um, and so the big gap that exists, I think in both the, the software, but also any, any AI driven tool is that you're going to have inputs that create outputs, but then what do you do with those outputs? It still requires human decision-making and effort to apply what AI is generating to, to go and do a particular thing. And people are starting to bridge that gap just lightly where maybe it'll create an output and then it can reprompt to create more of those outputs or et cetera. But um, I kind of have a vision of a world where, especially for the digital marketing types, you're running either sales funnels, landing pages, you're running cold ads, that that an AI driven decision machine could be guided by a couple, uh, you know, initial inputs, some things that you put together, but that it could rapid split test utilizing AI to find the absolute winner. So we've been, um, it's been since like June of last year. Or so I've been working behind the scenes, just almost no one knows about it. This is one of the first times I've even shared about it uh, in any public forum. Um, but this, this, we've already kind of validated that the, the technology is possible to do that. It's just a huge, heavy lift, very much worth doing, but it's still a huge lift to be able to make AI do what it doesn't do currently, which is, is, uh, decision-making now, now there's two sides to this coin. One is that you've got to trust the AI, right? And, uh, two, you have to know when it's potentially not getting it right so that you can make adjustments with an eventual goal that it can literally run your marketing for you. You have some initial inputs and some pieces that it that it can figure out, but the goal would be to, hey, take, take this landing page, take the sales funnel that's converting at 1%, let's crank it up to three and a half percent over the course of seven days. And you push go and you sit back and just watch it scroll through the various tests that it's doing and variations and, and all these pieces. And, and at the very end, hopefully have something that is considerably beating your initial input. Yeah, that's that's really really powerful, and I appreciate you sharing even just high level what it is you're working on because that's that's kind of like the uh, like the golden goose, right, or the holy grail of a lot of what people want to do. And I heard a couple of things that you said that stuck out to me, which is you know sort of like where we're at right now, or where we've been over the last year is like talking a lot about generative AI, so using AI to generate outputs, just like you said, right. The next phase, to me, it's sort of like phase two AI is all about, again, just like you said, what do you do with those outputs and how do you make those decisions? And that's sort of where a lot of the, the work will be done. Um, and to your point, I think that's the stuff that will really surprise people because um, sure. that's really the end to end kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. The other question that I have is, you know, I, I heard somewhere on, on, on a podcast where it's like automations, it's, it's like they don't really work unless they work 100%, right? Mm -hmm. So like, there's the difference between 90 and 95% versus a hundred percent is a very massive, massive gap. So how do you think about like, you know, the other phrase is having human in the loop, right? Some people say having humans in the loop long-term actually makes the system better. And some people say, you know, to be honest, as long as you, if you can remove humans from the loop entirely in terms mm -hmm. of accomplishing the task, it's better. How do you think about, um, you know, in digital marketing for now and in the future, um, are you thinking about having humans kind of in that process or not? What's your thinking? 
You know, I being in the funnel builder space, which by the way, over the last three years has become so incredibly saturated with high level having a white label. So now everyone has a funnel builder, you know, click funnels being big. There's a lot of funnel systems out there. Um, but the number one thing that I've learned is that the human element is always the failure point. We should make t-shirts to say that the human element is always the failure point. Um, it's also partial. It's also the reason, especially with a collective of very smart people who can work towards a common goal, why you can achieve incredible things. But it's also the reason that things fail more often than they, than they succeed. So, um, if we, my, I'm, I'm pretty firm on the concept of if we can eliminate the need for any human interaction, period, eventually, um, where no human has to make any decision because that has a 50, 50 chance of being wrong. Generally, maybe the odds are a little different, but to eliminate that, it not only gives people what they really want is to, which is to do less. They want to be doing fewer things, spending less time, spending less money on other people to buy their own time back and just letting machines operate in a, in a very optimized focused way. I think that's the only path forward. Like the, the fact that right now, as I, as I'm, as I mentioned, the where we are at right now in AI, I think is going to be laughable at some point because like even the concept of you needing to give it the right prompt is going to be laughable, right? It's like, you don't even, eventually you won't even give it an input. It's like, uh, this thing just goes and does this thing for you. You set up once a, a system or plug into a particular system that can then go and just make decisions for you. Cause it knows what the output it's looking for is. And, and it also knows the data points that are non-emotional and it doesn't make mistakes. It's straight up. Is this version better than this version? Did it give us the output we wanted? Yes. Great. Okay. So then let's go that direction. Let's do it again and again and again. So yeah, I, I think humans will need to be on top of generating those machines um, but certainly not um, like outside of improvements, you, you won't be running it, those machines as we, as we see it today. I, I think the robots will, will over overlaps humanity and humanity will be happy about it because I think we all want more time. We all want, want more flexibility. And we are also acutely aware of our own frailty in terms of our own decision-making. I'm aware that some of the decisions I make are, I know for a fact, some of them are going to be wrong, but if, if I have, if a, if a machine knows what it's supposed to do, it does what it's trained, then it can't make emotional decisions. It's just like, where's the data. So, you know, let's extrapolate from that. Obviously you're talking in a funnel context, right? Which is a huge piece of what we do, what digital marketers do, right? We're all one funnel away from Jesus. So, <laughs> yeah. um, it's, so that's in that context, but let's extrapolate and talk about all these other marketing contexts. What is left for marketers to do when the machines are not only generating outputs, but also making the decisions? Do you see there still being uh, roles? Do you see it as replacing completely a lot of these jobs? Do you see it as a world where there's tons of business owners and, and it's a lot of like micro businesses or what's mm. your hot take on that? From a marketing perspective, I think um, for at least the foreseeable recent or upcoming future, especially copywriters who know how to leverage AI, but can still make, can still bridge the gap between what it, a business owner wants and actually helping them to get, to make that decision is going to be there. Like it's going to be a required piece, but I think a lot, a lot of roles in the digital marketing space are going to, are going to vanish. We are, we're already seeing AI setters, AI closers, uh, AI webinar generation builders. So now design is out funnel design uh, will probably be out soon. Um, like the manual version of what we understand uh, today, but you know, ongoing, I think the one thing that I, I think is eventually going to be possible, but not for, for quite some time is a, is kind of like the personality or charismatic leader type of role, which I think is critical to like lead people. And I think there's always going to be some human element, to business for sure. Uh, support roles might be a bit antiquated, but someone has to manage those, those machines to ensure that it's giving the right output and, and track some of that data as well. So, so I think a lot of the, the low level quote unquote types of jobs and tasks, virtual assistant types of autumn of, of tasks that need to be achieved. But what, what business owners are going to need to continually do is to create great offers. I'm not sure how 
how how it'll work for uh for AI to generate that type of thing knowing um it's going to have a lot more data points than we will but th there's there's kind of this intuition for a business owner who knows like okay hey I'm in this space I am an agency serving attorneys and I know because I used to be an attorney exactly what it is that those people need so I know how to like create an offer and craft that aided or guided by AI sure um, but I know what they need. And I think it's going to be really hard specifically because AI at least currently can't interface with the emotions and the mindset or the burning desires of the market. Right. So like that requires a human to be able to read that and say, okay, I need a solution to that particular pain. It's not being addressed right now. Then I can go institute a machine and AI, a, a bot or, or something to go solve for that. So that high level architecture, I think is going to, is probably not going to go away. Yes. And let me give you two hypotheticals because I love asking two questions at once because that's definitely how you do this podcast thing. But let me ask you two questions at once. So two hypotheticals. Let's say you're a, a freelance marketer, right? Whether copywriter, media buyer, let's just say freelance marketer. Maybe not a complete newbie, but you're sort of in the beginning stages. That's hypo hypothetical scenario number one. Hypothetical scenario number two is you're a business owner. Maybe you're an offer owner. You have maybe an info product or something like that. And you're sitting here in January, 2024, you're looking at all the tools that are coming out. You're listening to the forecast that we're going to have AGI this year, right? From Sam Altman, where do you place your bets? Where do you put your poker chips, either as a freelance marketer and what you focus on and, and where you go and where would you put your bets um, as a business owner or offer mm. owner? Yeah. So if you're a freelancer, maybe you just got a couple of clients. If you're, you know, maybe around that 10 K per month mark, um, I think it's time to really button down the hatches and get extremely and very specifically good at something. So you, I think gone are the, gone are the days where you can just do, do everything, be all things to all men. I, I just, I, you don't have any leverage without a lot of specificity being kind of like a beginner or, or quote unquote, lower level freelance marketer. Um, and you have to know a lot of things, but you need to, you have to be able to sp be specific enough that you can have an edge. Otherwise you have no leverage. You don't have capital, right? You don't have probably a huge team to, to buy your time back. So the only way to, to truly scale or to get where you need to go, I think is, isn't getting extremely specific with a very limited set of tools that you're going to implement to be able to laser focus into either a niche or, or a particular model. If you're a higher level business owner, your, your whole, you have a lot more firepower. You've got capital, you've got uh, often time, you've got leverage with teams and you have a lot of other assets and resources to draw from to create a larger potential output so you could be you could be more broad so maybe it's not like attorneys who are like injury you know a, a workplace injury which would be very specific in las vegas right and it's only for those particular people when you're bigger it could be like hey it's all personal injury attorneys across the country and you can go a lot more broad with that um but i think at, at the lower level your job is to find three, maybe four AI tools that you rely on and don't waste a lot of your time trying to figure out or don't build SaaS, don't go like build these big machines. Um, you need to like laser focus in on just a few subsets of tools that are really gonna help you get where you wanna go because that is your leverage. When you're a business owner at a higher level, I think your leverage is in creating those machines that freelancers then use. So if you're if you're a, maybe a bigger business owner, you need to sell to the sellers. So go after the agencies that are, you know, uh, helping personal injury attorneys in Las Vegas, right? So your leverage is in is in architecting a machine that can duplicate with each new person that comes on board, um, not even as an end user, you're supporting the people who have end users. So it's kind of like that, what I'd call a tier one offer being like, you hate, you, you help people specifically tier two is like, I help these people who help these people. hundred percent. I have another sort of question that something has been on my mind. Um, it's kind of pie in the sky, right? Cause it's like at a certain point, there's, there's so many unknowns that it's impossible to make a prediction, but I think a lot about like, yeah, you know, maybe some of the, like we said, the lower tasks, right. will be automated away. Like a lot of like generic copy or, or even some media buying decisions. Like there's a lot of stuff that will be automated away. Now, what remains is those business, business owners who are leveraging these tools and leveraging AI at a really high level, they're getting greater market share, et cetera. My question is just on the economics, what happens when those roles sort of disappear 
on the on the lower end and that is your buyer base right those are mm. that's where the, the the money comes from because it is easy to envision the future where it's everyone's business owners are cranking and we're not we're not needing these resources whatever and these jobs are replaced but do you have any thoughts about what happens to the economics when your buyers now don't have roles and don't have income or capital in order to buy your products and services Boy, I don't you're, know if that question makes sense. You're asking the right questions. It's definitely above my pay grade, too. I think I think that's <laughs> that's a really deep and and introspective, you know, quandary for us to grapple with. You know, what happens when the people who are buying from you can't pay for you anymore because they're being becoming obsolete, right? And like, how can you even predict that that's possible? Um, and I think an, an example of this and people in the copy world, especially are, are probably more familiar with a lot of the, the details, but I think Jasper is an example of this where, you know, they, they came out, they got over a billion dollar valuation, 1.5 or whatever it was raised a ton of cash, VC, big VC money. They were essentially a wrapper around chat GPT for meant for marketers, but at a hundred X markup um, versus like the, just going straight to G, uh, GPT. And then I, from what I heard, like open AI saw what they were doing so effectively. And they're like, Hey, we can go monetize this and make it as cheap as 20 bucks a month. It's that, that starts like this massive uh, decline that is entirely controlled by one organization. So really the, the jobs that are becoming obsolete, it's not because they want it to become obsolete or even that the tech has a reason to that. It can be as quick as someone saying, whatever your business model was or is we're going to replace that with our own thing and effectively compete with you out of the market. So right now, chat GPT could, or open AI could literally wipe out every single, like people hear me on this, every single AI tool that exists today. Um, cause I, all right, 95% of them, right? Because most of them are built on their, on their API. They can wipe them out in a heartbeat by just pulling the plug in a single day and it's all gone. Right. And they can completely, um, you know, have a monopoly on the market. So I think there's a lot of unknowns, both from a job security perspective, also from a technology perspective. Um, and I think a lot of that is, is really difficult to predict, but I'd say, ask, ask me that question in a year from now, and we'll see which jobs over, over the pe previous year have been, have become obsolete, you know, uh, you know, from various pieces of automation, but boy, that's a, that's a tough quandary to yeah, that's a big that's a big one I dropped on you, but I, I think that's a really fair um a fair answer. And there's so many unknowns, it's 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 hard to say. Um let me shift a little bit from uh the the doom and gloom obsolescence to what opportunities do you see that exist right now in 2024 with AI or just in the marketing space in general that maybe people aren't looking at or would be really exciting to explore? What sort of opportunities are are you personally seeing? Yes. So there's two pieces to this that I, I'm fairly excited about. One um, is the fact that most people around the world still don't know that AI exists, right? And even most business owners are too busy working in the business that they have they have no idea how to even tap into it. I mean, almost every day I'm sharing with some somebody new, like, hey, you can go to, just go to ChatGPT and go get this thing done or whatever. Like, hey, you need a logo? Like, you can mock it up for you. Go do it. And they're like, what is ChatGPT? And I'm just like, my mind is exploding because we think everyone knows what we know, but they don't. So I think that there's a, the, a, an incredibly large, massive, even opportunity of tapping into markets that have not even been touched yet. I've got a, a friend, his name is uh Stepan who is in Europe, but he's got a corner of a market. He essentially launched a Jasper uh, or copywriting tool for, I think it was the Czech market. Um, so it's all in Czechoslovakian and, and he was able to scale in like a matter of months from zero to 300,000 a month in, in Recur from just having direct ads into a niche of people who had never experienced it. And, and maybe because of language barriers or whatever, they didn't have a tool that, that could work for that particular market. So there's, there are countless amounts of even fringe niches that are so big and untapped um, that there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, the other side if you, so that's kind of like the, the freelancer approach, right? Based on your previous question, if we're going like higher level uh, where, you know, maybe you're a bigger business owner and you've got more uh, leverage, I think a lot of the tools ongoing that you're going to be building is I think going to be most powerful to white label 
I think we're going to see a complete resurgence of almost all tools across all sectors becoming a white labelable tool that you can then resell to end users. So anyone who's, in fact, I, I think from my own perspective, one of the mistakes perhaps that I made or something that I overlooked, I didn't even know, didn't think about was white labeling drop funnels to, to be provided to other people um, so that they can go resell. We now have a white label. And so we, we have some people using that and then they go resell it as a SaaS and we become their technology partner. We just run that for them. Um, but uh, we weren't first to market with that. And like the, the key here, the goal is to become first to market. And with that, um, even if it's a feature like being, being someone's um, white, them white labeling your tool gives them the prestige of like, they almost built it, which is like, we've seen with go high level, for example, um, they've crushed, they've absolutely decimated and taken control of the entire uh, like funnel builder market and digital marketing space becoming very, very popular because people got to experience the pride of kind of owning, even though they don't own it, right? Owning a platform that has their name on it, but they didn't have to do it. They didn't have to bring capital to the table. Teams, all they do is like onboard new users. And it's like, oh, it's it's my thing, right? So I think giving other humans more perceived or real ownership over particular tools is is a huge opportunity in the next year. Yeah, and that's such a that's such a powerful marketing lesson in general, right? Like, how can you give your users more status, right? Yeah. By being associated with you. That's really at the end of the day, right? It's, it's status and and it's the feeling and pride of ownership, but a lot of that comes down to that sort of brute feeling of status, right? I own a SaaS product now because I white labeled X Y Z, um, but that could be applied. I'm I'm sure that almost every business, if they spent some time playing around with that that question, could find an opportunity to be like, all right, let's boost the status of our end user. Um, Bro, I think that's, I, even even to the point, like locally, it, I know here, here, I'm kind of in a rural area in Western Wisconsin. We have a very limited amount of good contractors. Like I needed some electric work done on my cabin. So I called 12 different places and only one person picked up the phone and they're the ones who got the job, right? One person. So it's like, maybe they're all too busy or whatever, but they're, they just, they didn't have a great sales aspect to it. So it's like, man, if I could go white label one of these things and go market it better and put some people on the phone to actually answer like white labeling, any type of a service has a, a, a whole power of duplicate of duplicating existing processes and scaling that even into new markets, but with a marketer's mindset. Yeah. That's powerful. Um, let me just ask a couple last questions before we wrap up, which is what, you know, as a business owner and you have a technology company and you're working on a lot of stuff, I feel like, especially now it's been the case for a while, but especially now there's so much stuff going on, right? So many tools and AI is coming out and, and all these new like processes and stuff. There's so much to kind of keep abreast of and focus on. What mental models do you personally use mm -hmm. in order to prioritize the tasks you work on, make effective decisions, and filter out the news with the quality information that you need? Are there any sort of like, mm -hmm. yeah, I guess what are those mental models that you're using to keep your mindset healthy, frankly, and not go crazy in the, mm -hmm. this age? Yeah, information overload, right? Um, it kind of reminds me of like the crypto market where, you know, we all saw a huge crash uh, just happen, but it's the same concept of like, there's new coins being launched every single day. And there's no way you can keep on track with all of them. There's no way you can follow to know like what's good, what's going to last and what isn't. So I think probably the best model to adopt and, and that I've found effective is to stay blind to what's, what's happening with, you can go to there's an AI for that.com and you'll see there's like 12,000 different AI tools just listed on, on that one site. And you can find, an AI for almost any, any end solution that you're looking for. But I'd say we don't know how many of those are going to last or sustain or be completely saturated and then start to fall off. So I think it's, it's a matter of like, it's, it's probably bad advice for other people, but, but good advice for me is like, I'll only go out and try to find new tools. If it's a specific problem, I know I can't solve on my own. And I know that the existing tools can't provide for me. So um, here's an, an example. Uh, stumbled on Opus Pro, which can create short form reels out of long form content. And I used to own a video production company. And I, in fact, earlier, like a year ago, I was spending $5,000 a month on short form content to get edited and syndicated. 
and they replaced it for like a hundred bucks. It's, it's insanity. Um, and so wh while that's very powerful, if I had known about that, I wouldn't have gone, you know, the other route. So, um, yeah, I think it's, I think we need to be leaning much more into research versus like looking for like, what's the next shiny object? What's the next butterfly that's, that's going to be coming along. And even just giving that a little bit of time to kind of flush through the system to get filtered out, we're going to find that there's going to be a couple that reign, reign supreme and, and, uh, and last on top. Yeah. I think it's a great answer for me. I'm finding that the discipline of the basics still holds true. Right. And AI is just another name for new tools. It's a, it's a new face. It's, it's got a lot of complexity and it's, it's very new and it's probably far more powerful than we can even comprehend right now or are using, but um, the principles remain the same. Right. And so thinking about the problems and specific things that you want to solve and then finding the tools that will help to assist in that versus the reverse order um, mm -hmm. is, is probably the best way. Um, yeah. Well, Jordan, I want to thank you so much for your time. I, Think we covered a lot of ground in a short amount of time and solved all the world's problems so uh kudos to us but um genuinely thank you so much for for, for taking the time and i'm really excited to see what what you guys are have been working on behind the scenes yeah ha have me back on the podcast in six months and hopefully we'll uh we'll have something that we can we can show or or even demonstrate further but yeah i'm excited about where where the future of a is is headed and 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 what is actually going to rise as the to the top of the heap. And, you know, I'm hoping to be part of that. Hopefully we can build something that's so good that people can't resist it and that it truly makes a, an impact to them and their lives and in their businesses too. So appreciate you having me on. It's uh, it's been a pleasure. Awesome.